Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. All right, good afternoon and uh, and or good evening, Team Crew Lab community, and welcome back to the Brewcast. Uh, on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Brew Crew Lab Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, and the Marine Corps University Foundation. As you know, this is our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, the Operations Officer at the Kulak Center. Before we begin, uh, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent the views of the Kulak Center, the Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. So turning to our presentation today, um, our, our broadcast is focused on Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, for close to three months now. And um, as, as that invasion actually unfolded, a wealth of evidence has emerged on the brutality of Russian soldiers in the areas of Ukraine that they have occupied. Looting, sexual assault, extrajudicial killings, the deliberate targeting of civilian populations and infrastructure, uh, the list of potential war crimes and violations of international law is long and it grows, unfortunately, every day. However, despite the documented evidence, Historically, there are a number of challenges in bringing the perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity to justice. The law of armed conflict and international humanitarian law are often weak, leaky, and lack robust enforcement tools. Those tools also depend on the political will of the countries to enforce them, and that will is not always there. So today, our guest is going to discuss the framework of all of this, of international law and the law of armed conflict in the context of Russia's ongoing invasion as well as sort of uh, um, tempering expectations about the challenges that lie ahead for those agencies that will seek to prosecute Russian war crimes when the war finally ends. So our guest today is Dr. Joanna Siquiera, who is an international lawyer and a league ad from Poland, who currently works as a researcher at the Faculty of Law at the University of Bergen in Norway. She's also a legal subject matter expert at the NATO Stability Policing Center of Excellence in Vicenza, Italy. She did her PhD studies in New Zealand at the Faculty of Law, Victoria University of Wellington, and defended her title as Doctor of Social Sciences in Public Policy Sciences at the Warsaw School of Economics in Poland. She gained international experience in Polish diplomatic missions to Canada and Estonia, the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy in Germany, the School of Humanitarian Law in Russia, the UN CIMIC Training School, the French Institute of International and Strategic Affairs, and NATO. She's the author of eight books, over 100 scientific publications in multiple languages, and 40 legal opinions for the Polish Ministry of Justice on public international law, international relations, and security. Her areas of expertise are the South Pacific region, Pacific Ocean governance, and the law of armed conflict, especially the NATO legal framework, Central Europe, security, and the South Pacific, as well as gender and armed conflict. So, Dr. Sigier, we're very appreciative of you taking uh, the time out from the other side of the planet to come and um, explain these issues, these important issues to us. So welcome and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank uh, organizers for having me here, for inviting me here. And um, this is my, my biggest privilege uh, to, to talk about law of armed conflict, uh, but also using my uh, perspective uh, that is um, Polish uh, woman from Central Europe, because uh, when we talk about the war in Ukraine, we should not only focus um, on the military aspect, but also uh, this crash of civilization uh, about the West um, civilization, where the life of uh, human being is uh, at the top of the value, um, contrary to um, those values uh, which are represented by, by Russia. And here I will intentionally use this uh, comparison that uh, uh, the performance of, of Russian army has not been changed since Soviet Union. So what uh, Red Army did, uh, Soviet Army did, um, uh, is, is totally the same what we observe now um, during the war in Ukraine. Um, so here we must uh, understand the mindset represented by Russia um, we must uh, learn uh, the way how the perpetrator thinks, because otherwise we are uh, lost uh, and we will lost uh, at the end. Mm, because uh, for us, of course, the, the war is a tragedy. Um, killing civilians, uh, 
raping uh, women, but also children, toddlers. This is in the humanizing. Uh, but for them, this is not. Why? And again, we come back to the mindset. Uh, but we will talk about that uh, a bit uh, later. Um, yes, uh, when we speak, of course, about uh, Russia um, and, and this conflict, uh, this, this war in Ukraine, we should not forget uh, a Belarusian regime and what is happening on the Polish-Belarusian border with the instrumentalized migra migration, um, which is uh, also um, a new, a slightly new method used uh, in this war, in this in hybrid warfare, uh, because again, this is this is not the old way of, of uh, uh, war fighting. And exactly the center um, you're representing is, is well aware of that, of this uh, future war fighting that we have to be reminded many aspects, but also my aspect, that is law uh, fair. So fighting using the law mechanisms. And uh, here, please mind uh, what happened um, um, after annexation of, of Crimea uh, or Okay, coming back uh, to, to the beginning, that the Russians they falsified um, and the legacy of referendum of independence uh, referendum in Crimea, claiming um, that um, Russian minority uh, was under a huge pressure uh, from the Ukrainian side, um, and and then what happened in Lugansk and Donetsk republics? That was entirely the same case. So people living there. They were um, used by Russia to organize themselves in some kind of separatist movements to use the democratic tool, which is a referendum, to vote, to become independent. And after that, to claim for the protection for another partner, that is the Russian Federation. And um, of course, we can say this is some kind of absurd, but look at them, how they act. Look at uh, the legal and political implications, how, how um, uh, Russia is using existing law. Because what I always say to my military and civilian students, uh, dura lex sed lex, harsh law, yet the law. We might complain on the law, but on the other hand, it's, it's good to know the law and to use it. Because if we do not know the law, it will be definitely, most likely, uh, used against us. So, so this is very important to, to bear in mind how Russia is escaping from the international legal order. Just to remind you that uh, Russia is not anymore a member of the International Criminal Court. What happened? Uh, two years after annexation of Crimea, uh, ICC issued an order claiming that what Russia did was an illegal annexation of the territory of another sovereign country, that is Ukraine. And what Russia did? Russia withdraw from this court. So under this court, Russia cannot be judged. Uh, so this is not a, um, this is not how we see how we have in our national legal orders orders to look at international law as what we have at our national legal system, but this is far different. Uh, also, uh, in, the, in the structure of the norm of international law, there is no element of sanction. So, this is very important because please come back to the um, uh, order uh, issued by another court, that is international Court of Justice being a body of the United Nations, um, claiming that, uh, of course, invasion to Ukraine is illegal and Russia must halt the invasion. But then again, that, um, um, that order um, made, uh, um, was it, uh, sorry, I don't know, I, I don't uh, remember exact date, no, 16, exactly, 16th of March, that order had no sanction. There was no element of enforcement. So, sorry to say, but did you expect that Russia, Russia would really halt the invasion? Just reading the sentence of this uh, order? Of course not. 
and also just to tell you the uh, scale of the voting there was uh, 10 to 2 so for um the judgment uh, there were 10 uh, judges and against were two were from russia and china so you can see that that um judgment was of course binding on russia yet uh, it uh, has uh, shown the biggest weakness of international law that there was no element of sanction on or enforcement measures so again what we have uh, coming back to the first court uh, i recalled international criminal court yes and um, it started its uh, um, uh, its um, proceeding but then again this is in the case not against the perpetrator so this is only very stage of collecting evidence if there is a war crime happening now in Ukraine. Of course, for all of us, we've been witnessing those uh, videos, uh, pictures, we collect evidences uh, from, from refugees, but please put emotions on side. Me as a lawyer, I have to rely on the law and on the judgment, right? So, of course, as a human, I, I watch, I observe, for me, this is, of course, clear. Uh, we have been witnessing war crimes uh, done by Russians on the territory of Ukraine, yet, according to international law and law as such, we must wait until the judgment to, to claim if that was a war crime or not. So, um, and then uh, you can ask, uh, okay, so we will only wait for the judgment from which part? And then I will argue because uh, I don't see the legal basis for for states to unite uh, um, to create, for example, ad hoc tribunal like we had uh, ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia or Rwanda. Because even now we can observe the lack of unity across the European Union when it comes to sanctions. So what even more uh, when it comes to uh, calling, so naming and blaming the perpetrator? Because ladies and gentlemen, when you watch the news, especially from, from Western um, uh, Europe, you would hear such words as not war, but situation, what is happening there? We support Ukraine, okay, but against whom? First thing is to call who is the aggressor, who is the perpetrator. And um, not from the beginning, not at all, uh, from the beginning of the war, after some time, after uh, bringing more um, evidences, um, especially here, I, I mean, uh, France and Germany, they, start, they started to say, yes, that the Putin is, uh, uh, is to blame. But then again, ladies and gentlemen, this is not only about the president. This is also about the nation supporting the president, understanding the value of uh, this imperialistic approach of um, their national duty to spread their idea against the rotten western world um and and here i will use my examples because i've been to russia both professionally and personally and um, i've been witnessing such uh, such sentences uh, uh, claiming that russians are better than other nations especially slavics uh, and just to remind you me being be, being polish i am also slavic but uh, that always they were saying such sentences that Ukrainians are cattle, that uh, they are worse than Russians, and that has always been Russia. And just to tell you that I was in 2014, so exactly a few months after annexation of Crimea in Moscow, and everyone whom I was talking to, professor of law, um, lady at the grocery store, um, people in the hotel, they were supporting that annexation. They were saying that was always Russia. It finally came back 
to um, uh, Mother Russia. So such approach uh, is, is still present. Just, just look what happened after uh, some companies uh, uh, stated that they will withdraw from the Russian markets. Did Russia uh, people organize some marches? some protests? No, they went to Ikea because that was the last day to do some shopping, right? Uh, and again, that might be frustrating. That might be what is happening. We, we do not know that. But again, I, um, I will um, ask you kindly to start to think as perpetrator to understand their legal manner. Uh, even, of course, we might say, yes, they do not follow the law. But then uh, I always use this why why do they do that isn't it that they know that they will not be punished for that how about energy security ladies and gentlemen we had in europe Nord stream one now uh, germany was a huge promoter of Nord stream two which uh, this project itself was uh, since the beginning a big threat for the European, Central European energy security. And energy security is part of the national security and sovereignty. So uh, you can see that uh, Russia was, was using those kind of uh, methods uh, to remain um, this, um, the only provider for, for Europe to make um, uh, economies in, in Europe uh, reliable uh, only on, on Russia. So now when we observe the war, uh, I am not surprised that uh, Europe is, is not united. Uh, should we uh, sanction Russia? To which extent? From which date? Um, and also it comes to the legal uh, consequences. Because I personally, but again, it's, it's not about my opinion, but, uh, but the experience I, I, I have, uh, it's hard to imagine that um, Russian decision makers will be put to international uh, court uh, because uh, there are many, again, um, legal and political obstacles. Um, first of all, we, we must understand that um, international order is anyhow similar to national orders that um, you have to be party of the court to to become um, to to become accountable. And as I said before, international criminal court, none of the parties involved in the war, so Ukraine and Russia, they are not part uh, of uh, of this court. We have international court of justice at the UN. Um, Yes, but as I told you, there was already um, a sentence uh, from 16th of March um, and Russia did nothing. They, they didn't find that um, uh, judgment uh, fair. Uh, and of course, uh, we can say that, uh, yes, there are some other possibilities uh, like uh, establishing ad hoc uh, tribunal. But again, I, I think this is uh, a legal miss. We will not uh, witness that. Um, and what can we have also? There is a procedure in, uh, in international law. There is so, uh, this uh, is so-called the jurisdiction uh, on an unlimited basis. Unlimited basis, and that is uh, famous uh, for, um, uh, for the... Uh, um, Augusto Pinochet, exactly. He was the first time uh, ever arrested in 1998 under this uh, universal criminal jurisdiction in London uh, on the genocide and terrorism, and recently in Germany, um, two uh, Rwandans uh, accused of leading the rebel, uh, rebel uh, group in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. They were also uh, convicted of war crimes using this and universal criminal jurisdiction. Um, and that potentially could be used uh, in Russia because Russia uh, also has uh, its own norms on universal juris jurisdiction. But ladies and gentlemen, we must not be naive that um, Vladimir Putin will not uh, 
um, remove himself from from being the head of state, and uh, if uh, he um, will even resign from the office, uh, I do not think uh, his uh, the people around him, both political and military, would accept. Uh, Mm, uh, to extradite him. Uh, this is also um, impossible. Uh, we all know that. So, actually, when, when I went through each possibility under international um, law, uh, this is very, very hard to do so. Uh, but again, law is one thing. Another is political will. And as we said uh, before, it's, um, it's hard to, to get uh, the this uh, unanimity uh, even in intern, uh, in an international arena in the European Union so not even about the sanctions so uh, how to claim the um, the bringing Vladimir Putin to justice and again this is not only him but also his uh, uh, generals and all uh, all those uh, who are advising him and and just to um, I remind you that so far, zero, not a single political leader uh, of the country has been held criminally responsible in a trial before international criminal tribunals for war crimes. The, the closest possible was um, the former president of the um, uh, Socialist Republic of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic, but he died in 2006 um, uh, in the hack, in the uh, in arrest, waiting for uh, for the um, uh, proceeding to be finalized. Mm, so, as you can see, mm, it takes ages, but mostly decades, uh, for international uh, criminal proceeding to to be finalized, and that gives enormous uh, possibilities for potential um, for for those uh, perpetrators for. Um, and war uh, criminals to escape, to locate themselves elsewhere under um, change name, uh, to provide an alibi, um, to protect themselves. So you can see that, uh, again, international law is, is built, as I say, on a very good um, promises. But of course, when it comes to action, we must remember about the politics and uh, raison d'etat of, of each state. Uh, there is another uh, interesting uh, case of uh, the Kenyan president. Uh, um, and uh, this is, uh, I think this is worth uh, recalling because uh, the president Kenyatta, he was accused of, of uh, killing his um, political opponents. And even the international proceeding uh, has started, but after some some years, some uh, connections made by the president, uh, that uh, that proceeding uh, was ceased, and this gentleman is still uh, a president of Kenya. So, so you can see that despite uh, evidence, despite that proof of evidence that is uh, uh, essential, that is uh, obvious. Um, the, the legal mechanisms might not work, might not work because uh, not every state might be willing to, to do so. And I very often receive questions, okay, but if we know that this is the, um, that the international law is uh, uh, weak, leaky, as the title of, of our uh, meeting today, then what should we do? And in in uh, my concept, uh, I think that the the, the worst uh, part uh, is the big five of United Nations, uh, because Russia and China will always uh, use their right that is veto if they dislike uh, some matters that they are against their interests. Uh, because yes, today we talk about Russia and Russian aggression and all those crimes uh, um, which have been done by the, the Russian soldiers. But how about China? Nobody thinks about putting sanctions on China, despite what uh, Chinese government uh, is doing to their own citizens, uh, 
to to um yeah, other nationalities religious uh, minorities um so you can observe that uh, some kind of hypocrisy that we are like yes we should not uh, um yeah that we should uh, claim the justice uh, um, uh, for those uh, um criminal activities but on the other hand we we still do business as usual uh so when we tackle uh, the the russian problem we should not uh, forget about other regimes uh, belarus uh, north korea syria venezuela because if we that is, this is just an helping a uh, tool for other regimes because they are observing, they are observing how far Vladimir Putin will go and how far we, we will react. If that reaction would not be uh, good enough, then we send a clear signal that um, we will not um, punish um, the perpetrators. Uh, so, so this is uh, of a very huge importance uh, that we must not forget that uh, after this war we will have to tackle the international order maybe from the slightly different perspective uh, stop uh, thinking um since, uh, well i don't want to use such words as um but uh, exactly we we thank you <laughs> um we we must remember about uh, different perceptions and they will always be different and here I would like to uh, say that uh, I was and I can he see here uh, one of my uh, colleague from from the course uh, military course uh, we had uh, this uh, this February exactly when uh, when um, uh, the war started and I said it publicly that uh, we must expect Russians uh, to deliberately attacking civilians and civilian infrastructure and my Norwegian um, colleagues officers they they disagreed with me by saying no 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 it's too early to say that uh, we should not say that about Russia because uh, collateral damages will always happen and for me again being Polish legal advisor I was like, I, I didn't comment on that, but for me, that was 100% clear that that would be definitely deliberate uh, civilian attacking. It, it was just a matter of time because, uh, again, our mindset in, in our mindset, it's like, no, we, we should not. We must not do that. We have to do everything to protect civilians from our uh, part, but also from the uh, enemy's part. But this is nothing like this when it comes to Russia, but of course other regimes uh, too, that they use. So uh, I, I recently um, been interviewed by, by many just the next second uh, Srebrenica. I would say no. What we are witnessing, this is um, war crime, not genocide. Because again, we are using our lenses when we see killing, torturing, raping civilians, but the Russian aim is not to destroy the nation. As we said a few minutes ago, Russia don't see, uh, Russian people, they don't see a threat in Ukrainians. They kill them because they are on their way to um, accomplish their goal right they want territory they don't want to kill the entire nation they want to get the territory and um, i can even tell you that uh, uh, i i gave an interview on the second day of of um war for one of the norwegian media uh, but at the end, I, I didn't accept the, the the whole structure of it because Norwegian um, journalists, uh, they were saying, OK, but we cannot uh, say that Russia is an aggressor. Of course it is. And second, they said, OK, but we have no evidence to claim that Russia uh, wants to get back to um, its borders after Second World War. Of course, it is the goal of Russia to come back to its sphere of influence, 
in Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, and I, I remember that, uh, again, Poland, Baltic States, uh, um, Czech Republic, uh, uh, Slovakia, uh, Romania, uh, we were all saying, watch out for Russia. Watch out because uh, the, the methods of uh, ruling that country, of um, having uh, army, uh, which is uh, anyhow um, under, you know, disciplinary sanctions measures, no, you will have us, Europe, uh, world globally, uh, will have problems with, with Russia. But then we were called as some uh, paranoid, some Russophobes, and that has nothing to do about, uh, about the, the culture of another country. It is about being um, able to recognize the potential threat, the potential source of conflict, uh, and, and here, uh, exactly, I can talk uh, more and more about that, but uh, we, we must uh, rely on the um, evidence we had in the past. Just to remind you, Chechnya, war in Chechnya, how many civilians were murdered by Russians? 300,000, 300,000. Was there any ad hoc tribunal against Russia? Not at all. Were there any sanctions? Russia at all. So, and then actually before, and I was uh, in Transnistria uh, in October last uh, year, what happened there? 1991, 1992, uh, domestic war in Moldova. And uh, when I hear some people saying that, yeah, but Transnistria is uh, like autonomous republic inside Moldova. Anyhow, this is territory of Russia. When I was entering with there with, of course, for, for touristic reasons, but with my, my diplomatic friends, uh, we were checked by uh, Russian soldiers everywhere were the base of, of Russian army. Uh, people, miserable people, they were stuck in 70s by their, you know, appearance, but also mindset. Uh, petroleum, gas were so extremely cheap because they're an, entirely on. So why would they? Uh, quit such Russian support for them. Everything was perfect, right? So, so this is what I said at the beginning that Russia uh, has been uh, using this uh, lawfare to to uh, make people actually want to be part of uh, um, Balshaya Russia, so big Russia. So we would see this uh, arch from Lugansk, Donetsk, um, um, Crimea, Odessa, and uh, to Transnistria. So for me, this is absolutely clear what uh, Russia is uh, aiming to. Uh, and uh, again, I am not surprised that the world, especially the, the Western countries, they are so, so blind. They don't want to accept that, that the, the of Russia, what Russia is uh, having such uh, endeavor, territorial endeavor, um, because exactly after annexation of Crimea, what kind of sanctions we had? There were some sanctions, as, as I remember, uh, that the Russian politicians uh, uh, couldn't go to European Union. Do you think they wanted to go and have coffee in Paris or uh, have some chocolates in Brussels? Of course not. They have better places to go. So, again, for us, having this mentality would say, okay, if we recognize somebody as persona non grata, if we will stop some political binds, that's, that already is painful. But for Russians, anyhow, of course not. Just look what now they are doing, that they are stealing um, the uh, logo trademarks of, of even McDonald's, right? Why would they? Like they can create another um, Papa Vasil or, or something like this. They they just uh, switch the big M, M McDonald. So, so again, we we must not be naive about uh, Russian way of of tackling problem problems. But there was a, an international criminal court order. So the highest of the highest norms of international law from the court. What Russia did, they withdraw. 
another uh, ruling from International um, um, uh, Court of Justice, the body in the UN, uh, that Russia should halt the uh, invasion. What Russia did, didn't listen. So what Russia understands is fear of is the power, is the power, not the law not the law this is totally different legal mindset right so for us if we are given legal order if we are given norms yes we do follow the law because we feel that if we do so we are protected by the law by our state by our community or by the regional arrangements like we have uh, here in the european union union uh, but all are other regional groupings. But for Russian mindset, uh, as I said before, a human life um, is uh, anyhow a value. Uh, and here uh, I, I wanted to say a few words about those uh, mobile crematories. And uh, I know that uh, journalists uh, across different countries, uh, they were saying that Look, that Russian soldiers, they brought those uh, mobile crematories uh, uh, to hide uh, the scale of uh, the massacre they were doing. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is not for Ukrainians. This is for Russians. This is for Russian nations to uh, hide the huge failure they are facing, not to send bodies of those soldiers back home because then their families would start to ask okay but they supposed to be on some military drills what's happening so those mobile crematories are again to uh, uphold the empire of russia that russia is still big that uh, russia uh, is doing very good things like combating uh, fascist Ukrainians, as, as they say, right? Um, and uh, probably you, you've seen there are some videos uh, that uh, Russian uh, Orthodox Church is, by the way, anyhow, church. Those are uh, FSB uh, officers, so those priests. Uh, and, and so they were using some icons uh, flying in helicopter, by the way, Ian, something for you can check that in a helicopter with the, the holy, um, you know, um, how to say to justify what Russian soldiers are doing. Um, and uh, I, I think I will stop here because I, I made a, a many, many uh, notes here and, and actually we can talk, talk, talk aspect possible things, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious how are um your questions what would you like me to to ask uh, so so thank you from from my side uh yeah dr sikira thank you very much for that um and uh no i've, I've got a, a ton of notes here to start working on and i'll first i'll say to the audience if you have any questions um please feel free to enter them into the chat and then i'll go through i'll like i said i'll go and ask them because you don't want to hear me talking the whole time um as, as well, that thing about the icons and the helicopters. Yeah, it's not something I carry with me when I go fly. Um, but then uh, I've I've never sort of never felt I needed that sort of justification to go do the mission, which maybe they do. Um, so um, kind of the first thing I had was this is sort of a, a devil's advocate question, if you will. And I'm not I'm not trying to be facetious, but it's I, I think it's a, a fair thing to ask in, as you laid everything out in terms of what is what is the value is, of these legal frameworks that we have yeah. if they if they do not provide a deterrent against um, illegal activity or or stopping crimes against humanity um, if they're hard if not impossible to enforce if in the cases of of people like Slobodan Milosevic like you mentioned if you do get the perpetrator it still takes years for the process to play out and you know if someone can die before they even go to trial the process takes so long um and if you know as russia has done if they don't like if they don't like the court that they're under they can just leave it and and then argue that the court has no jurisdiction because they're part of it 
So with all of that, then what is, what, what value do these legal frameworks have? Um, and if, if their value has been sort of, if, if Russia's actions recently, and not just Russia, but also, as you mentioned, you know, things that China has done um, that have not really gotten them any kind of blowback, what is the value of these frameworks? And if, if these things are, if they don't have any sort of value, do we need to look at some different frameworks to, um, to ensure that the people who do, you know, commit crimes against humanity or war crimes do receive, do get some sort of justice? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, a few replies as uh, I keep uh, receiving this, uh, this question very, very often. Why should we, especially from military students, they are the best in that. Okay, but why should we follow the law if the enemy is not? And, and... Oh, I, I, and I, I just want to be clear. I am not saying like we would not follow the law. I mean, we, I, 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 to, I know from... what you mean. I, yeah, okay. that, that was a, jo a joke on site. Uh, I know what you mean, of course. Well, first of all, um, we need um, uh, that legal order, no matter how weak it is, because if we will not have it as we have now, we would have anarchy. So better to have it weak than none. And also about um, obeying the law. I always use this metaphor of uh, the red light. The fact that uh, somebody else is driving on a red light, it doesn't mean that you have to, because you don't know what the consequences uh, will you bring, right? So this is very important, but also about the uh, credibility on international arena. And here I mean money. Because look at the prisoner of wars, how they are treated by Russian soldiers and by Ukrainian soldiers. So, of course, for, for Russians, they, they don't care uh, about uh, dignity, um, safety, health, uh, life of, of prisoners of, of war. Um, so, of course, they breach international humanitarian law. But from the Ukrainian perspective, and I, I don't claim that all, they all play... Um, you know, good that they play uh, with clean hands because we also can can see some some nasty stuff. But what would Ukraine lose is their credibility as a future part of the EU, as the future part of NATO. They want to be seen worldwide as the Western country following international law order. So from this reason, Ukraine cannot act against the law. They, they have to uh, protect uh, uh, all the norms and also um, prisoner uh, of, of war, this, war, this kind of uh, protection. Um, I, I think this is, this is very uh, interesting that uh, following law uh, is beneficial, I would say, if we want to stay in a big family of, of Western world where um, human life is at the top of the of the hierarchy, and then we must. And uh, and here we come exactly to the part of your question where when where you mentioned China. So what we can observe after this uh, this war is again split of the world, like like we had uh, uh, after the Second World War uh, on on countries. Um, uh, following democratic norms and non-democratic, even though the, they claim uh, they, they do follow. And uh, I can tell you that I was hosting in Poland my free students from China. And uh, <laughs> that was, uh, well, I asked my dad not to ask them about democracy in China. Of course, he did. And uh, Chinese students, they were showing him, look, the, the, the videos, how... Uh, we we treat po uh, people with dignity with respect um that was unbelievable that was unbelievable but this is what they are being fed um and of course if those uh, students were able to go to the eu uh, their parents uh, must have been very high in uh, the, the party structure because otherwise they would not be able, not be able then how that uh, story ends because i think that that's worthwhile saying None of those free students returned to China. My my last question to you is, so going back to uh, kind of earlier on in the presentation, was you talked about yeah, as, as we observe things that, you know, 
us from moving a distance might see as war crimes on the battlefield, right? You mentioned how you have to put emotions aside and focus on the evidence and the law and the judgment that ultimately comes from that. So um, I was wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit on what that actual process of documenting a war crime for the purposes of prosecution would, looks like today, you know, under the current legal frameworks. Because, you know, I know I'm probably as guilty of it as anybody, right? Like I see I see a video of something on social media. I'm like, of course that's a war crime. Like, you know, it's obvious, right? Um, well, you know, it's also, obvious, right? I, I'm also the son um, of a lawyer but... and a judge. So I understand there's an evidentiary process and you have, there's a burden of proof that you have to meet um, and, and that takes a bit. So for, for and, and how that does that work it. for some of the things that we've been seeing on the battlefield to go from, I see the video that looks horrible how do I turn that into a, a charge that can be prosecuted? Yes, every every evidence uh, in a form of a video recording of a picture of a witness statement uh, must be collected, but then checked if it's uh, because uh, as we know, especially now, everything can be falsified very, very easily. So, so this is the, the very first uh, stage uh, to, to check. Uh, of course, uh, the, the first ever is, is this initial um, uh, like beginning and the, the commencement of, uh, of the proceeding. But as I said, first, this is in the case, not against, uh, against any perpetrator. So the, the, the Russian Federation is not uh, called yet so no naming and blaming, which which uh, would be of course much easier. But uh, it will take, I believe, years or maybe decades to collect those evidences uh, to uh, to make the ruling uh, on um, on their basis that uh, yes, we have been witnessing uh, war crime or aggression or this and that because again. Um, there are some definitions of those uh, particular acts, so also court uh, must decide uh, which uh, which of those uh, uh, those uh, subject uh, uh, matters are are we talking about, and and then uh, if we will have uh, uh, such final order, but then again I I said before that uh, that uh, that we might not even. Um, receive such judgment because very often uh, we can uh, we can see that um, the memory uh, of the act uh, fades with the course of time so we might have another war and another conflict and everyone will forget about ukraine exactly how they us uh, forgot about chechnya and and the georgia uh, war in, in in georgia also i i've been to georgia and uh, there are still um uh, republics they are uh, um, under uh, russian protection right uh, so this is the thing and and then uh, you just just to uh, finalize your your question um if we have the sentence on on which uh, uh, war crime we are talking about then we will look who is guilty who is guilty uh, and of course uh, when we say in a positive way, we will have uh, a sentence, we will bring the uh, person um, or persons responsible in front of the uh, court and, and that person can expect 30 years of imprisonment or, or even long, um, depending on that person's state of health uh, and so on and so on. Great, thank you. And uh, now that, that point you made about the fading of the memory, um... I've seen that a lot, actually, as people have been trying to document it. They're trying to make that point of, you know, you, you it seems you might be full of that righteous wrath. Like I talked about before, like in the moment, but that emotion can fade. And yes. um, especially as as down the road, both Russia and, you know, advocates for Russia will try and paint it over or make it go away. Um, exactly. or obfuscate the issue. So yeah, making sure that just the memory of it doesn't fade has been uh, something I've seen a lot of people trying to make sure that they capture. So I know uh, we had Lieutenant Colonel Kobeck on here and sir, since you're in, in the room basically here with me, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask the question directly, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, I'm afraid to for the bandwidth issues, but uh, so thank you very much. This has been extremely informative. I uh, appreciate your, your 
information and knowledge that you're sharing on this. Um, most of the questions I initially had you answered, um, but as we were talking about the fact that Russia really respects power, not necessarily the rule of law in this respect, I was thinking to Ukraine, right? If they if they do want to be inside that that circle of trust where where you respect the laws um, and you want to be inside the NATO that you fold, is there any potential chance in this conflict that they could get some blowback? Um, I know they're they're not the aggressors here, so it's unlikely that people will be looking for anything wrong that they're doing. But do you see any chance in this conflict of that uh, coming back against them? I, I'm not sure if I, I got the, the whole um, question of, of yours, um, because, uh, again, it's not that I'm pessimistic and I do not believe in international law. I am just more realistic and pragmatic in a sense that, yes, we have some legal tools, but even what is more important is political will. And here I do not uh, see that political will, especially in Europe. And here I'm in France and, and Germany. I, I spoke to my uh, colleagues, American uh, officers from Hawaii, and they told me that in the media, it seems that Europe is uh, united and everyone is uh, um, uh, for the sanctions against Russia. But this is not true. This is not true. So when we see that lack of uh, unity when it comes to sanction, how can we expect that unity when it comes to uh, bringing the perpetrators um, to the justice? Uh, I do not feel so uh, because uh, still Russia is the biggest provider of, um, of, uh, of, of gas uh, to, to Europe. And the, the main argument in, in Germany uh, in politics is that they cannot afford uh, raising uh, bills for ordinary people, but also their economy is totally reliable on uh, Russian sources, but also uh, trade with China. So that's another tricky fact that uh, um, I would again say openly, this is some kind of hypocrisy that either you you stick to your Western uh, values uh, or you are um, exchanging uh, money with, uh, with uh, regimes uh, such as exactly Russia and China. So I, I don't think uh, the um, people who are, who are guilty of those war crimes in Ukraine, they will be ever brought to international court. But as uh, in any conflict, there's usually uh, things that skirt the the edge of, of things that are done like uh, ethically on both sides. Mm -hmm. So we've seen definite uh, evidence that Russia is not uh, beholding to, to the LOAC or the law of armed conflict and some of the other laws that are respected by the rest of the world. But what if evidence of Ukraine actually uh, conducting some of these actions in, in, in defending their homeland comes to light? Do you see any potential that they could potentially be uh, be held uh, liable for actions like that, even though they are um, the victims in this conflict? Yes, a very, very good question, because uh, uh, stating that Ukrainian soldiers are not acting fair is at the moment politically incorrect. You will be most likely accused of being, uh, you know, troll uh, of, of, of Russian propaganda. Uh, and uh, yes, I, 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 I see your point. This is very important also for me as a lawyer, just to tell you, first of all, which is the national language of uh, President Zelensky. Okay, ask yourselves. Um, next, uh, why Ukraine uh, is not part of International Criminal Court? It signed the Roman Treaty, but never become a member of it. Why? Because that was easier to be under the, the Russian umbrella, uh, um, not to become a member of this court, right? So it, it's not that, and I agree with that, what you said, that this is also not that everything what Ukrainians do, uh, this is entirely uh, clear um, and, uh, you know, done with, with white, uh, uh, with, with, with clean hands, not. But then again, it's a matter of uh, um, political connections, how uh, Ukraine wants to be seen uh, on the regional and global arena. 
uh, what kind of uh, partners uh, Ukraine want to uh, attract. Uh, of course, uh, we, we can see that uh, Ukraine has uh, asked for the, the quickest uh, access to European Union. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not only about the war. How about corruption? I mean, big corruption, which is not only uh, pumped by uh, the oligarch, as we like to say, but this is the mindset of, of people. And I will never forget my very first international conference. I, I was in Ukraine and my colleagues, my age people, they were telling me, Joanna, but if you don't pay, you will lose the case. I was like, excuse me, this is how you want to build your new democratic state. So again, this is also about the mindset of, of people being homo sovieticus. This is very important, not well known in the world. Homo sovieticus, people not knowing democracy, not knowing choices. They were always being under the boot either of the Tsar or Lenin, Stalin, then uh, Russia Federation, that is FSB. So they do not understand what democracy is. And uh, also, just to tell you uh, the Belarus uh, case, I remember 2020, there were some democratic marches in Minsk and other cities. And my colleagues from Norway, they organized a conference that Belarus will soon become a democracy. I wanted to laugh so badly. So again, stop using our Western lens, uh, our mindset, understand their way of thinking, their mindset, their values, because uh, values might also be bad value. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I do actually have a couple now here in the chat here. Um, but uh, if you do have a minute, I want to make sure we get to before uh, we call it a day. So um, from yes. the Lieutenant Colonel uh, Glenn Dorner, this question is, is the international crime of aggressive war still a legal judgment that can be rendered and a valid tool to potentially prosecute Russian leaders? Yes, of course, I could say yes, because I even here I, I have um, the, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court um, and, and we have definitions of, of uh, aggression, of uh, war crime, genocide, uh, but then we have law, written law or, uh, or uh, customary law, but we have also interpretation. And here, when we have interpretation, you can expect from each lawyer totally different interpretation. And when we add national interests, uh, uh, that's, that's even worse. Because first of all, we cannot expect that uh, Russians would um, expel um, president or um, his advisors or uh, military leaders. Uh, but again, to do so, we would have to have um, the uh, unanimity uh, uh, from from other countries uh, claiming that, yes, we, we see the need to do so. Uh, because uh, still, as I told you before, also about the sanctions, countries, they are not pro and look about, uh, look at, uh, look at uh, Africa. Uh, here, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the reliable on um, wheat and, and other sources. So food security. Uh, so, so you can see that some countries will not be um, willing to, to show their political will to cut off the ties uh, with, with Russia, just like now. Uh, with China, when, for example, it comes to Taiwan, that's another topic. But, but again, we have legal tools. Yes, we do. But then it's a matter of, of uh, interpreting those, those norms and using them. Great. Thank you very much. And so I think, uh, yeah. um, so I believe this is actually from your, um, your Finnish colleague here. So, um, who was with us right at the start. So um, I was going to read it out. It's uh, it's a few sentences long here. So uh, his question is not about clear black and white cases, but more about the gray areas. At the very beginning of the invasion in February, uh, we all saw Russian strikes on dual purpose civilian facilities, such as uh, you know chemical or or some industrial sites, and we're also seeing now Ukrainian strikes on similar dual use 
such as oil and gas facilities on Russian soil. Um, some of those, those I, I've seen those videos, they're very pretty dramatic, lots of fireballs. So uh, what are your thoughts on these kind of dual purpose civilian targets as a gray area in the arm in war between two sides, both of whom have very different views on the laws of armed conflict? So this is actually, thank you, thank you. Um... For, for this at all, for this question because it's it's somehow uh, similar to the previous uh, question that, uh, that uh, how far of Ukrainians go uh, to still uh, play a fair game uh, uh, yet to to accomplish also their military goals and again me as a lawyer I would say no this is not a good way to do so uh, because uh, they might lose even more not only military but uh, as we said before this. Uh, uh, cultural civilization um, uh, alliance to, to become a Western, uh, they are Western country, but as, as seen as, as such, this is this is very um, dangerous. And and again, um, those uh, those uh, targets that exactly we we've uh, seen those those videos. Um, so I, I will I will disagree on that. Uh, I know that, of course, every case is different, so we cannot uh, say yes or no. <laughs> I'm a lawyer, so I will never say definitely yes or definitely not you know, <laughs> about the case. Uh, but th this is uh, very often, I think, and, and here we could go that way, that those would be uh, preventive um, uh, actions, like, um, and, and then to some extent, we, we can move in this argumentation that this uh, this will uh, cut off the um, the logistics from the other side, or or something like this. And again, um, um, collateral damages will happen all the time, uh, right? Uh, but this is uh, the, the argumentation can be brought to the court. Yet, I do not think that case will be ever brought. Uh, will be yeah to the court. I, I don't think so. So we can we can talk about the law of armed conflict now in this uh, war of, of Ukraine, but I don't think we will see the 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 end uh, at court. All right, thank you very much. And let's see, I don't have any other questions here in the chat, and um, uh, we're we're approaching seventy minutes here, and uh, I don't want to push our luck with our connection too much farther. So um, I think uh, good to call it an end to this presentation. Um, Doctor, if you have any, any final comments you'd like to share? Uh, only to thank you. Thank you. I'm Curtis for organizing this, this venue. It means a lot to me. Also, thank you to the audience. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, this is important. This is also part of my personal mission to, to spread the truth, spread the legal truth, no matter how bitter it is. But we must be uh, aware that the enemy is using law, uh, lawfare. So we must be prepared because according to this Latin sentence, civis pacem parabellum, exactly. If you want peace, prepare for war. Also lawfare, as we are not anymore living in the uh, old way of uh, war fighting. So, so thank you for having me here. Uh, that has been my, my honor to, to uh, spread my knowledge, my experience, legal, but also cultural. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. And we, you know, one, we definitely, we appreciate you reaching out to us um, and talking about this so we can actually get you on the schedule. Um, you know, one is part of our professional connections with, uh, you know, that, that particular region of the world, you know, both the Scandinavian countries as well as Eastern Europe. Uh, those relationships are probably only going to grow here thanks to Russia in the coming years. So it's good to start pulling right. those perspectives. Um, you know, but also, like I said at the at the start, like this is one area that we have not really covered yet in this series, looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, you know, but I think it's it's one that will become more important the longer longer it goes on, because the longer it goes on, at some point the military aspect is going to stop, and then these are the questions that are we're really going to have to be prepared to ask and answer and find ways, you know, to enforce those mechanisms that we do have. Because there's, you know, that that's going to be the next the next part, right? Making sure that there's yes. a just peace once it's all over. Correct. I, I so much agree with that, and I'm I'm happy that you see that 
as I can tell you, not everyone uh, does. Not everyone does. And that might be a potential threat uh, next and in aftermath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot easier to just to sort of forget things and move on rather than stick with the very the uncomfortable issues. Anyway, you know, it could be we'll have to get you back on here at some point in the future as well if we start. I am start very happy like to, gonna... to be part of this uh, this family. So <laughs> thank you very much. I am available for you always. Oh, great. Great to know. We'll add you to our, our short list of future speakers then. All right, to everyone in our audience, thanks for sticking with us today. I also recorded one with Dr. Weber earlier this morning as part of our special special down the rabbit hole on the Russia-Ukraine war with him. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting actually both of these posted kind of back to back this weekend uh, to give folks some things to think about as well um, on our broadcast schedule. Um, if you've been following us on our email or social media, we do have some more episodes coming up next week. On uh, Wednesday, we're actually going to be uh, fortunate to get the commanding officers of two different uh, Marine Expeditionary Force information groups to talk about how they uh, support the Marine Corps in, in operations in the information environment. Tying back to Ukraine and uh, some of the things we talked about today, information and the information domain have become a, uh, a significant area of, of interest and ways to gain advantage for, for all sides. And so, those two gentlemen are going to explain to us kind of how the Marine Corps is going to approach this. And then as well, we have um, a guest of ours from actually the Swedish Defense University who's going to be talking to us on Friday. And uh, that's going to be Dr. Marcus Sigorensen, who will be looking at Russian military thinking, which, as I, we mentioned with Dr. Weber this morning, what the Russian military is thinking is a very open question some days because it's not always obvious what their their strategy and their end state are a, apart from just sort of generalized brutality so he's going to kind of walk us through that on the next episode so we hope that all of you can join us for one or both of those next week education is what's important training preparation for the expected education preparation for the unexpected